want to uh, just present the results of some older and some newer experiments in uh, understanding the extratropical um, extratropical response to uh, to the MJO. Okay, and I want to acknowledge, uh, if you can hear me, um, one of my students, Priyanka Yadev, and uh, postdoc Eric Swenson, some of these experiments. Um, so as you know, just to introduce it again, the MJO is the largest element of intraseasonal, here I mean by 30 to 90 day variability in the tropical atmosphere, um, and was discovered by Roland Madden and Paul Julian in 1971. It involves a large scale coupling between the atmospheric circulation and tropical deep convection. Um, the atmospheric circulation actually goes all the way around the globe. Tropical deep convection is more limited to the Indian Ocean and Pacific Ocean. So it's, I want to emphasize that it's not, uh, it, the, we'll see what MJO actually looks like in the real data, but the abstraction of it in our mind, the, the paradigm we think of it, is a traveling envelope of enhanced and suppressed convection that propagates eastward. Okay, so these are results. Uh, what I've shown here is actually just um, it's a paper trying to distinguish fast and slow MJO episodes, but that's not the point of this slide. <coughs> <coughs> what we see are two Hofmuller plots. So time goes up, longitude goes across, and what you're seeing is the OLR just averaged over uh, tropical regions, I think 15 south to 15 north. And so when you get these, these values of low OLR, here are these dashed uh, curves, means uh, the outgoing long wave radiation is coming from very high clouds, so it's assumed to be convection. Um, and we've drawn arrows to indicate uh, what we consider to be episodes of the MJO, which have various, some of them are faster, the green ones are slower. Um, just keep in mind that, that this is kind of our uh, imposition on the data of, our, of, our, of how we, we organize the way we think of it, that we think of a blob here and a blob here as, as part of an eastward propagating um, oscillation. Again, here, it's a blob here, and then the convection appears here, and then later on it appears here. Okay, so, so the actual... Um, this is what the actual data looks like, because when, what we do then to analyze this, and this is a point I wanted to make early on, is we take some kind of complicated uh, EOF of the tropical circulation, okay? And the lead, so we reduce the data in effect, okay? And, and uh, reduce it to a model of, of something that propagates around the globe where you can get an amplitude in the phase. And so you do lose uh, some of the detail of the real data in doing that. This, this is another example of um, the velocity potential. Um, this is uh, actually taken straight from the Climate Prediction Center's website. This is the velocity potential. Um, with negative means uh, tropical convection. Now time goes down, OK? And this is just the five-day running mean um, at, some smoothing, and you can see again these episodes, sort of blobs moving. When you do this EOF reduction, it's a standard RMM1 and RMM2 indices, um, even though in the real data you see their periods right where the, the, there's a blob moving in here to here, but right in here there's not, right in this point there's not that much convection. Um, this has been reduced in a sense something much lower dimensional to an oscillation that has an amplitude and a phase, these standard RMM indices. Um, one of these is the forecast, and one of these, uh, in this particular paper, and one of these is the, is the actual observations. But for our purposes, it doesn't matter. So the idea here is, if it's in this phase, the, uh, it's in phase one, the convection somewhere in, in uh, the, Western Hemisphere in Africa, and as it moves through phase three, the convection is, is in, in the Indian Ocean. And so in, in this particular case, you can see there's a regular progression. But uh, in fact, in either forecasts or observations, you can get periods where this particular model of the MJ is clearly crazy because the amplitude decreases and it starts propagating the other way. Okay, This is kind of a result of our the way we reduce the data to the simple two-dimensional um, so just keep that in the back of your mind. 
Um, so when the amplitude's small and the propagation goes the other way, it's, it's not clear this really has anything to do with the real data. So this is another standard example of what the phases look like. Um, and this is from a Kasu paper, which I'll return to. Um, whenever that, that standard two-dimensional uh, representation is in a certain phase, you just average all the, um, the OLR in this case. So negative means, negative means um, right convection. That says the convection in the Indian Ocean in phase three. Um, and we'll be seeing a lot even next week about uh, teleconnections between the Indian Ocean and, and the Atlantic. In phase four and five, it moves across the maritime continent. And by phase seven, um, it's already in the, in the Western Pacific. And it, it goes between phase one and phase eight. And the, the contours are sort of just the average stream function. So let me just already make a point that it makes sense to average the OLR at different phases, because that's how we know where the, the forcing is, OK? Because the, we're supposedly talking about tropical forcing. It's not clear, once you get to re, remote regions from the forcing, that it makes sense to average the, the stream function or the height field at the same time, at the same phase, without a lag. Because there, there has to be some time for the propagation to be, the influence to be felt in mid-latitudes. And that's kind of the subject of my talk. Um, so there, so as I said, the, the simple measures of uh, simple regressions or composites of upper level field are based on different phases of the MJO. Clearly, the mid latitude fields, if we want to try to anal uh, analyze or estimate the remote effect, they should lag the MJO heating, but by how much? Do we have any guidance at all by that? Um, and OK, that's the other, the other thing that we could try to look at is tr uh, see what, how the teleconnection patterns change. Um, so this is, um, this is just a paper by, uh, this is actually a paper by Hai Lin. So um, this is simply arguing that, showing that the response of 500 millibar height to phase three with one day, la with one pentad lag, five uh, five days and ten days, and they're different. Okay, and you can definitely see that by ten days, you get this strong. This is what Andy was referring to as the teleconnections. You can see a strong signal of what looks like an NaO plus in the Atlantic here, positive here and negative there. Okay, and you also get something at phase seven where it looks like it's a negative NaO. But this kind of, this is sort of a standard way of looking at it. It evolves after some time. Another way that people have looked at the effect of this is, um, this is going to take a little explanation. So we have these indices, NAO, PNA, right? Um, and they're symmetric in the sense that every day there's an NAO index, right? You just sort of project it on a single pattern. It may be positive, it may be negative. But there's a, um, and it may be, very, may be very close to zero, in which case uh, you don't, I guess there's not much project, you know, we can't really say what the NAO is doing. There's sort of another world view of how we, we organize uh, mid-latitude uh, circulations, and that is to try to come up with, it's, the mathematical term is cluster analysis, to try to come up with a, set of preferred, a set of states such that any single uh, map and any day can be classified as belonging to one of the, one of a, a set of regimes or, or, or clusters. And this is statistically justified by the fact that the distribution, the probability distribution, and I won't go into the mathematics, but the probability distribution is not really just a, a multi-dimensional Gaussian distribution. There are regions which are slightly more preferred uh, in, there are states which are um, more preferred than other states and states which are less preferred. This allows you to make a classification, not completely unique, but um, useful classification, which people have used for a long time, at, particularly in Europe, of these regimes and a standard winter, boreal winter, 500 millibar height, uh, um, well, uh, 
set of regimes would look like this. So there is something we call the NaO uh, minus and the NaO plus. Um, they're, not, they're not just the opposite of each other. Okay, so that's a non-trivial point. Also, there's um, something called the Atlantic Ridge and the Scandinavian blocking regime, which is very high here. Um, so any, again, any state in this data that was uh, in the period this was used, um, which was, I don't know, 30 something years, um, any state can be classified by being closer to one of these four than the other. So the question then is, um, so those are the regimes, and this is, these are the same NA, uh, MJO composites that I showed you before, actually just going through eight phases. Why do we put these on the same, um, on this, Kasu actually did this. Why do you do these on the same page? Well, the idea is to see with a certain time lag whether these states become more, any of these states become more preferred after a certain lag. So here it is. This takes, uh, I, I realize I've, I've looked at this so often, it's very familiar, but it is a little bit uh, confusing when you first see it. The rows are simply the phases of the MJO. So just think of this as Indian Ocean convection, okay? What this shows is, um, and there's a, the columns refer to the, the frequency of occurrence of the regimes and the data. So again, 10 days comes out, just like in Highland's paper, 10 days comes out somehow from the data as being, being reasonable. So this is the time lag. So basically, what you see is we, when the convection is in the Indian Ocean and you wait about, uh, this is 10 days here, okay? This is the probability of occurrence of the NaO plus uh, goes up by 40, 50, 60%, okay? And, and it sort of increases as the, as the lag goes from phase three. And of course, phase, this whole thing moves down this way, phase four, because, um, Phase four follows phase three, so when the lag is less, you should be getting a similar, a similar increase in the probability of NaO plus, whereas you get a, a corresponding increase with lag of the probability of an NaO minus occurring um, about 10, 10 days, almost up to 60% more likely to get an NaO minus than normal about uh, 10 days after phase seven and eight. And again, phase eight occurs after phase seven, so these, th this thing should just be moved, moved to the left. Um, so just to remind you, um, the, we're talking especially about the NaO plus and NaO minus, which seem to have a, a strong relationship to the MJO. Okay, so um, it, this is sort of a, we, we talked yesterday about interpreting this in terms of a quasi-stationary uh, quasi response. So the idea here is that the Rossby wave source, which we talked about yesterday, is created in the Indian and Western Pacific Oceans as the MJO convection propagates eastward. And there's quasi-stationary wave trains lead, to, um, turns out they lead to the retraction of the Pacific jet um, and changes to the associated fluxes of momentum and possibly implications for Rusby wave breaking in the Eastern Oceans, Eastern Pacific. Um, another way of thinking of it is um, the index of, re well, the wave index of refraction, similar to what we saw yesterday in the stratosphere, is relevant to the response. And so there's, um, there's gonna be some sensitive to changes in the basic state, which means that if models have biases, they may have trouble. Biases in just the basic states of the winds through quasi-geostrophic theory, that would lead to changes in the uh, sort of index of refraction for the waves. Um, the propagation of the MJO influence into the North Atlantic, because this is all, you can sort of all see this happening in the Pacific with forcing in the Indian Ocean, but what, ha what, how come the signal is so clear in the Atlantic? I think that's not as well understood. I think that's one of the big challenges in the physical understanding of the response is why the response is so clear in the Atlantic compared to the Pacific. So, okay, so this is just what, to review yesterday, remember this is what we're gonna, these two terms are what we're gonna call the Rossby wave source, because I'm going to actually show you that later. Um, 
Okay, so if let's g still think about stationary wave theory. I want to review briefly two papers, um, okay, you, you, which use the idea of stationary waves and then review, then go over some experiments I've done, um, which have a, uh, a kind of a different approach. So the, this is this paper by Matthews et al. in 2004. Um, and Andy, were you, I don't know, were you a co-author on Matthews? And, no, okay, but Brian was. This, this was, the basic method here was very interesting. It's to use a model, okay, a full nonlinear model, but a dry model, completely dry, all right? And um, it's, it's, you start about a climatological basic state, three-dimensional, meaning that it has variations in, in, in pressure level and latitude and longitude, okay? And you have a constant forcing term, which is concocted to try to keep the model close to that basic state. And what you do is you, um, so if you just let the model evolve, it, it, it should evolve very slowly. There's a certain way of, of, of doing this, of, of massaging the model. So you add a heating, okay? But now since the model is completely dry, you can add the heating arbitrarily as a source. And um, you integrate, for the first 25, uh, what happens is after you add the heating and you compare it to some control simulations, you can see a difference and you can see it directly related to the heating. And you're saying, well, what about all the baroclinic, all the baroclinic instabilities, all the mid-latitude storms that form all our weather? Um, it turns out they actually don't show up until about 25 days of integrating. So this is a very uh, sort of model with high damping, okay? So the, the basic idea is you can estimate a direct response to tropical heating from this. Um, if you, I think they look at day 19 of each integration. They put the heating in different places and look at day 19 and they can estimate, estimate the, the direct tropical response um, because the model is fairly damp and at fairly low resolution. So what they do is, uh, they put tropical heating anomalies corresponding to a 48-day regular MJO cycle, and they prescribe a vertical structure. And they basically start, all their experiments have tropical heating in one of, uh, one of these 48-day positions. So they basically put heating in the, uh, over Africa, and then the next experiment they put a little bit further east and a little bit further east. Okay, each, each one of those positions is a separate experiment. Um, and they pick a forecast time, which is 19 days, in each run. Um, so the response to heating is well developed, um, but it's not over, overrun by baroclinic transients. And you get this picture, which takes a little bit of explaining. What you get is, for example, here, this is the two, uh, 200 millibar U wind again, OK? Um, this is an anomaly correlation averaged over the entire extratropics between the model wind at this particular day 19 of the forecast and the observed wind. So here, what this lag means is that the model integration was started, this lag is about 10 days, right, where the, um, this is sort of the initiation of the, the, the westernmost position of the MJO in this scheme of things. So the heating is probably over Africa. And 10 days, um, so the model integration was started 10 days previous to, 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 um, to, to, to this time of the MJO cycle, okay? So the model integration was actually started probably, you can just, this is a repeated, a repeated cycle. This is the MJO cycle. The model was started back here, and you're comparing it to the U wind at, at day zero, and you get a correlation with, with about a 10-day lag. Um, but for... Um, the MJO cycle, comparing to the MJ, the middle of the MJO cycle, where I guess this is probably the maritime continent, um, you only need a two-day lag. So the model integration started two days previous to the time equals 24 in the MJO cycle, has a uh, high correlation, very high correlation with the observed um, observed you at day 24 in the MJO cycle. Okay. Um, so the only the point I wanted to make is you can you can interpret from this, 
from these model experiments, you, we, the lag, we don't understand the time lag, whether it's two days or 10 days, um, and there's issues of model bias here, but at least there's some ability to say that, no, I can formulate a stationary wave problem and, and 10 days later compare it to the response to a particular phase of the MJO. So in this world view, okay, the response to the MJO to each phase of the MJO is completely separate, right? They don't influence each other in a way, right? You want to understand the response to the M MJO in a certain phase, put that, just think of it as the stationary response that would occur if you just kept the forcing fixed, okay, with a certain lag, and we don't quite know what the lag is. Um, the other hand, um, this is the picture I'm going to show you the picture that I showed you yesterday from Grant Brandsetter's paper, but I'm going to explain it a little bit more carefully. Um, we're going to have heating events that only last two days in this model, again, a dry model. Um, so basically, um, the idea here is that you do a whole bunch of forecasts with a full nonlinear model, you repeat them, a whole bunch of initial conditions, then you repeat you do 100 forecasts, then you repeat the forecast by putting a, a pulse of heating in a certain position for two days, turn it off, and look at the anomaly, the differences, okay? Um, and this is what I showed you last, showed you last time. Um, so this is the result of day three, day six, and day nine. And the idea here, well, what I emphasized uh, yesterday was the fact that, okay, this actually looks like the same, similar to the field, in, in this case, 300, millib 300 millibar uh, meridional wind, the same field that you'd get if you just kept the heating fixed there, okay? But um, think about this for a minute. Um, sorry. Uh, think about this. So this is a nice picture. This is actually re very relevant for the MJO, right? So you put the heating, that's what, phase four, I think, of the MJO, where the heating, right, is put, it, put in the, uh, over the maritime continent. And um, so it's over the maritime continent for five days or three days, whatever. This wave train starts to develop, all right? But now if I want to, to look at the downstream response anywhere, five or 10 days later, this, this yellow circle is further east and stays there. So to get right, and it starts developing its own wave trains, especially going to the northern hemisphere. And then 10 days later, it might be in the central Pacific, and it, it keeps developing wave trains. So if I'm downstream anywhere, particularly over the US or in the Atlantic, I have a complicated problem, right? Because I'm getting wave trains that come from this, from the heating several phases earlier of the MJO that have finally reached me, and I'm getting wave trains that are that, that started er, uh, later than that, right? Which are starting to reach me because they started closer, right? So if I'm, you know, if in three days it goes this distance, in in nine days it goes this distance. If I'm sitting here. I'm going to be getting kind of a sum of all these wave trains from these moving, these think of these yellow dots as moving. Yeah? It's not clear. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not clear. Um, I think the wave train, it seems that the wave train probably gets faster than the source, okay? But the point is that, so to think of it, the, that's kind of kind of the right question to, to be asking about, because at a certain spot, you re, you're kind of getting like a superposition of signals, right? So some of the older signals came from further away. So basically, there's a way of doing this in physics. In physics, this is just a remote response. This is standard physics. A remote response at any point in space and time um, will depend on this to a source, which depends, which has this complicated space, space and time dependence, will depend on this Green's function, which connects uh, both the, the source time and the response time and the source position and the response position. 
So this, from this point of view, this seems kind of hopeless. So, um, and on top of which, I'm going to actually skip over this. Uh, we talked about this yesterday, but the role of mid-latitude instabilities. On top of all of, this is just the direct response that we're worried about here. On top of that, of course, we have the, the response to the uh, varicopic instability, which is a different issue. Um, but I want to get back to this idea of how can we begin to have a methodology which responds to the full cycle of MJO experiments. So MJO heating is not just, it, it's not just stationary heating. We might be tempted to model it as that. In, in fact, it's a cycle of heating. And one other point I want to go back up to, which has not been, still hasn't been talked about much, even today, pardon me while I move back, is please notice that there's not just heating here, there's also cooling, anomalous cooling. Okay, and it's, it's never, very often it's not clear in experiments whether people are really just targeting the heating in the phase three in the Indian Ocean or the heating and the associated cooling. Because extra, more convection in, the, in this region may mean less convection in that region. And it's actually well known from very old studies uh, that models on a seasonal time scale can be also sensitive to, to cooling in certain areas or the lack of heating. So the way we wanted to approach this is, um, slip ahead, is to use, to do intervention experiments, which are very different. So the first thing is you use the full, the first important thing is use the full ocean atmosphere couple model Sophisticated convection parameterizations, parameterizations for boundary layer, for turbulence, okay, everything sort of, in this case, it's the CESM, a climate model from National Center for Atmospheric Research, um, which supposedly simulates the climate very well and tries to take into account a lot of different feedbacks. Um, and don't, so you don't force, the, there's no way to force the model with specific heating because the model generates its own heating. Okay, heating due to, to fluxes from the surface, um, heating due to latent heat release, radiative heating. What you simply do is you add something to it. You add a specified evolution um, of heating in X, Y, in pressure and time. And um, what you're going to add is somehow supposed to represent an MJO cycle. Okay, in this particular experiment, we actually made it too complicated. We tried to take a typical MJO cycle for a whole season from real data. Um, but what you do is you add the identical evolution of heating to each member of a large ensemble. Okay, so you have, you do seasonal forecasts from either the, uh, initial conditions from a long run or from, which in this case it was, or you could even do real initial conditions. And you repeat those by adding the identical heating to each of the ensemble members. Um, and this then allows you, so there's something in common among all the forecaster or seasonal experiments that you've done, because they've all had the same heating added to them. And this allows you to use a statistical technique called predictable component analysis to pull out what is in common in every, what, what is in common among all these ensemble members in terms of their evolution. And that's the response to the MJO. So you leave all the internal feedbacks in the model untouched. So before I even show you what the added heating is, what, what that means is if I add heating somewhere in the model, okay, the heating will, incre will increase the vertical velocity in the tropics like we discussed yesterday. Guess what? That vertical velocity which you're adding to the model is going to cause increased latent heat release in the model. It's going to cause more convergence, okay? And the model will take that added vertical velocity and maybe magnify it, right? And leading to more clouds than were there before, and then you'll get more radiative cooling because they're more upper level clouds. So all of these complicated radiative effects are left intact. I haven't touched them. I've just added something. Um, so let me, it's enough word here. This is, in these experiments, don't ask me why these look so blocky. Okay, they're not continuous. That was a technical issue. 
which we've since overcome with a different model, but never mind. This is, this is an example of what we've added to the temperature tendency equation. Right? The models have an equation for thermodynamics where they update, they update the winds, and they update the, the surface pressure, they update the temperature. All we've done is added this heating to that tendency equation. So this is, it's out, confined to the tropics. I'm showing you the tropical average. At three different longitudes, what, and this is in, uh, these are 180, 180 day time period starting from October 1st, where, where all the forecasts started from. And so um, this is, I'll show you another picture of it that makes more, may make more sense. The point is as the MJO, if there are three cycles, and as the MJO evolves, it, through it, it gets, the, the heating gets uh, deeper and deeper. This is pressure level. The units here are degrees per day, so it never gets really much above a degree per day. A degree, Kel a degree Kelvin per day in terms of how much temperature tendency I'm adding. Um, and this was, uh, Carolyn Le Pen actually designed this to be representative of the heating uh, from a typical uh, MJO, having three MJO cycles uh, um, originally derived from trim data, from satellite data. So this is the, this is the plot that gets misinterpreted by a lot of people. So I better really be careful here. Forget about the colors, okay? Ignore the colors. I hope you can see these, these blocky lines here, okay? Can, can you see these, these lines here? 0 0.5, and then this is one, uh, 1 1.5, 0 0.5 is here, and this is the 1.5 here. These are the three MJO cycles. Okay, so this goes from, um, so this is longitude now, all right, from 60 degrees, all right, to the Indian Ocean to the uh, Eastern Pacific, and this is time, um, this goes actually up to 180 days from October for six months. This is what we added. Just these, the, and again, the fact that they're very discontinuous was a technical issue we had to do with the model. Um, this is what we added. We added three MJO cycles. If we don't add this, and we just look at the, the same run, the run that was started from the same initial conditions, this is the heating that the model will produce. This is the NCAR model, the CESM. Um, and I think the contour interval is two degrees per day. So it's, it's very hard to see here, but when it gets up to this high red, it's 10, 12 degrees per day. So the model produces on its own, without any help from us, it, it produces quite a bit of tropical heating, but um, since time goes up this way, you don't you see some eastward propagation occasionally, right? But you don't see something that really jumps out at you as the MJO, right? Because the MJO should be well. Here's something, but then there seems to be the heating seems to be going um, westward that this time goes up. If I simply so again. Maximum magnitude of 10 degrees per day. I add this blocky heating, just constant, you know, at every, uh, add it to the temperature tendency equation. The total heating from, started from the same ensemble, um, initial condition is what's given colored, what's given in color here. And what's, when we started these experiments, this was totally not known what would happen. We first of all worried the model would blow up, which it didn't. Secondly, we were worried that the model would do something crazy. But what happened was actually quite interesting. The model, what happened, this heating here, which has a lot of variability in it, but nothing too obvious compared to the MJO, was simply reorganized by this added heating. Okay? So this is ex still extremely noisy heating, right, in here. But sort of the envelope of it is... is, is um, organized by the, the relatively small heating we've added. So we basically uh, ma made the model have an MJO. Um, and if you average over all 50 experiments, or 40, however, something like 50 experiments, that same plot, the same evolution, and this is another important feature. Here you can see the added heating in, in black and the response to the heating. Um, I don't even have the contour, sorry, but it's, it's the ensemble mean response follows the black heating. 
So that's just, so normally, just, just back off for a second. Normally, if you don't add any heating and you look at the day-by-day -day response, uh, the day-by-day -day tropical heating in the model, and then you average it over many, many runs, you expect to get, it, all the details should get washed out, right? So all you would expect to see is something like the mean heating, which is what you do here. The fact that we get this surviving in the ensemble mean is a further indication that we have something in common among every single member, every single member of, of the ensemble. So then there's a statistical technique um, called signal-to-noise optimizing EOFs or predictable component analysis um, in which I'm going to try to make this as simple as possible. It's like EOF analysis, right? In EOF analysis or principal component analysis, you get a series of patterns, each one with a time series, also sometimes called the variates, right? And the, the patterns are fixed and the time series uh, change in time. It's exactly the same thing here. You get a, a, ser um, a series of fixed patterns with time series. In EOF analysis, the leading mode, which is the leading pattern and the leading time series, uh, maximizes the amount of variance. In this case, it maximizes the signal to noise. Okay, so EOF analysis you can apply to just one ensemble member. This predictable component analysis you need to apply to a whole, in order to define a signal and noise, you need to have an ensemble. Because the signal is what's in common in the ensemble, and the noise is what's not in common. And so these modes can be defined on a daily basis, trying to pick out those modes which evolve, which are most in common among all ensemble members. And what you end up with is the leading two modes um, actually form some kind of an oscillation. So look at just the black curve. Well, actually, yeah, look at the black curve, okay? So this is just the lag correlation between the leading two modes. So if mo mode one leads mode two, you get a correlation of 0.6, and you get a higher correlation of 0.8 when mode two leads. So this turns out to be the signature of an oscillation. Okay? So you can apply this to any aspect of the model output, including the Rossby wave source, which is what we defined before, if you remember, the advection by the divergent flow of the um, vorticity. It, and that actually turns out, this is, of course, the Rossby wave source is the most closely d related to the heating. And that is the highest, you know, that looks uh, correlations of 0.8 and minus 0.8 with lags of about 12 days. So that, the leading two modes do describe an oscillation. And um, you can apply the same principal component analysis to the heating, which is insightful because the ensemble mean heating day by day, now just look at the colors here, and forgive me, now we have a longitude going up from zero to 180 and time going this way, just to confuse things further. And you can see the eastward propagation, but even in the ensemble mean, there's still some noise, okay? I think you saw that earlier on. Um, even in the ensemble mean uh, here, there's still, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of noise. But the predictable component analysis pulls out the uh, contours here, which are this a smooth representation. This is in watts per meter squared, this is vertically integrated heating. A smooth representation of that, um, of the most predictable, the most, the leading two most predictable modes of, of diabetic heating. So now you can try to relate, um, you can relate them, so you can relate many features of the simulation, okay, to the, uh, through the predictable component analysis to the MJO cycle. And another point that somebody made was the importance, I think Hai Lin made this yesterday, the importance of the feedback of the varicolinic transients on the flow as an important dynamical modulator when you look at the response. Um, and so what we did this in, in this experiment was actually fairly simple. What you can do is you can write, um, okay, 
this just this year is just the the convergence of of, of the uh, that's the, the horizontal wind, and these are the prime means transients with periods of about ten days or less. You can see the convergence of vorticity flux. This will just this term here is is corresponds to a change in vorticity, and you just take the inverse del squared operator to make it a change in stream function and multiply by f over, f over g to get a change in height. So approximately, in the barotropic sense, the tendency in height is related, uh, can just be obtained this way from the uh, convergence of vorticity flux due to the transient eddies. OK, and um, so this, this encompasses both um, the extraction of kinetic energy from the mean flow and actually um, no, if the momentum fluxes are also involved here, so this could you can relate this in some way to less be wave breaking. So, for example, um, it, okay. So the the way to understand the understanding these modes is actually a little bit tricky because there are two of there are two phases, just like the barotropic instability modes. There are two phases, and it oscillates between them. Okay, so just looking at one phase or the other um, is not as insightful as you might imagine. Um, so what I want to show you is, uh, first of all, um, this picture, okay? This picture is trying to give you a cartoon of what actually happens. Again, this is the time going from October to six months, and this is longitude. And the colors are the vertically integrated heating, the same leading optimal modes, the two of them together, that I showed you before, OK? Um, this is exactly the same picture I showed you before, except it was on its side. And um, it not, so we can add, we can control what the added heating is. We can't control the way the model responds to it. So even with this optimal mode filter, you still get a rather complicated um, evolution of the heating. But you, you do get cooling, heating, cooling, heating. And there's some heating here. You do get several cycles, OK? And um, the Rossby wave source at 32 degrees north, which is just exactly where I showed you in that picture of the Sardis and Hoskins paper, where the, the Rossby wave source starts to get pulled out of the, the deep tropics, is um, it's shown as a function of longitude here, OK? And you can see it's quite coherent uh, in some ways with it. The cooling is, is followed by is positive, and the heating is followed by negative. Okay, um, and what we see. What about further downstream? In what I showed you, or which one? Um, here I actually show you the storm tracks. Okay, so this is the high pass kinetic energy. So it's basically related to the storm tracks. And it's interesting that the storm tracks appear. You can see the storm track response um, in the Eastern Pacific. Again, somewhat consistent. Um, all, uh, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. And finally, to verify that what we were doing actually makes sense in terms of what people observe in the Atlantic, is we, we did something completely independent of this predictable component analysis in the Atlantic. We took all the data from, from all the runs, OK, and did this cluster analysis that I showed you in terms of getting. So each day belongs either to the NAO plus the NAO minus the Scandinavian block or the Atlantic Ridge. No filtering of the data. Usually in cluster analysis, you do some kind of filtering of the data to try to remove the baroclinic transients, OK? But the whole point of this experiment is to follow things day by day. So absolutely no filtering of the data, which is normally not done, OK? And so every single day, OK, um, every single day, what you can do is you can look at all the experiments for that day and just find out how, many of, how, how often the NaO plus was present and how often the NaO minus was present. present. How often the NaO plus was present is given in this, this I don't know, magenta or purple curve. <laughs> and how often the NaO minus was present is given in the green curve. So you can see already in these experiments, OK, so sometime after the heating 
passes the uh, it actually sometimes after the heating propagates out of the Indian Ocean you're getting a region where the NaO plus is much more like frequent than the NaO, NaO minus and uh, there are, there are periods uh, the cooling this cooling certainly is followed um, no, you don't, you don't actually see the opposite very much in these experiments. You, you see more the domination of the NaO plus over the NaO minus. Of course, this is extremely noisy because I've done absolutely no filtering. So there are many other, um, this I'm not going to go into in, in great detail, but the modes that I looked at for the height field and for the vorticity flux forcing, which is the transient forcing, were completely hemispheric modes. And it turns out that if you stare at these correlation curves, and they're, they're very confusing, they just show, though, very clearly that the leading mode of the vorticity flux convergence leads the leading mode of the height response um, by five days. Okay, so the transients actually have a very important effect here. The leading, the Rossby wave source, the leading mode of the Rossby wave source leads the leading mode of the height field by about the same amount with almost a correlation of zero one. Okay. So piecing these um, and then it turns out that the the the, the leading the second mode of, of the vorticity flux also leads the second mode of the height field, which then leads back into the into the forcing of the first mode. So it's a it's definitely a cycle. Okay. And it is extreme it, it's a little bit hard to disentangle everything that you want from this, from these experiments, and we're still working on it. We're working on actually different versions of these experiments. So, um, trying to summarize that what we've learned from these experiments, that um, strongly propagating nature of the predictable components, this we really get cycles. We don't okay shows that the cycles of MJO heating and cooling, the cooling could be just as important as the heating, okay, lead to propagating and not stationary response. Um, and all the elements of stationary wave theory are in play. The Rossby wave source, the tight coupling of the baroclinic vorticity flux convergence to the height field. Um, these results can be interrogated further um, in terms of understanding the interaction of the storm tracks, the role of barotropic instability in the Rossby wave breaking. Um, and we're still assuming relatively uniform phase speeds for the MJO. So the one thing I want to close with is current work that we're doing in which we went back to observations and we said, wait a second, there's another problem. The MJO, as remember it's these blobs that move, that seem to move, but they don't always move um, uniformly. So this is an example of a, of a recent paper, okay? Um, where, where you see in these, again, these famous RMMM pictures, you see various uh, MJO cycles taken from data. So here's an MJO cycle, okay. Here's one where, you know, in this, in this particular example, this particular example, they move fairly quickly through different phases. Um, but here's one where um, it tends to stay in one phase for a long time, okay, before propagating out. Okay, and you can see that uh, again there there are more well the amount of time it spends in any any of these orbits spends in any one phase is quite variable. All right, um, this is just to indicate you know cases where it's it's there are more dots in one phase here than there are perhaps in another in another phase where it may not stay as long. So we try to quantify this over 35 years of era interim reanalysis. And um, this is what the Fianca Yede did. And so we looked at the time that it takes to propagate from the Western Pacific into, sorry, the Indian Ocean into the Western Pacific, something like a, a phase three to phase six for each MJO episode. And just, we try to discriminate between things that look really like an MJO episode. And this is the propagation time from phase three to phase six in days. And this is a histogram. And there are a bunch of fairly, 
quickly oscillating modes, and there's kind of a minimum, and then there's some longer. There's some longer modes, okay? So the question was, is, was there a distinction between the shorter modes and the, and the modes that take, uh, the, the oscillations that take longer to reach? Um, so we did this typical comp lag composite, for example, for one case of phase, they, uh, phase four. Um, and we actually found that day zero looked very different than what people normally find. But what we did find was that the strongest NAO response occurred actually a little bit later, not from phase 10 days after phase three, but 10 days after phase four. Um, and this is sort of an NA, strong NAO plus response. And it occurred, it's actually much stronger here than it would be in, in the more rapidly growing modes. So the forecast pictures that Andy showed, showing the middle latitude response, okay, from forecasts, um, I think it may be dominated by the, the episodes that take longer. Um, and the last thing I'm going to show you is um, there's a hint that the, there's also a change in storm tracks. Um, so these are the slow cases, okay, and we start from day phase three at various lags. What I'm showing is the heat flux, the meridional heat flux with a very climate transients, okay. Um, the anomalies are given in shaded and the contours are climatology. So you, you, you get a Pacific storm track and an Atlantic storm track. And um, there's definitely storm track, there are definitely shifts in the Atlantic storm tracks, okay. Of further south, okay, that occur as part of this response, okay. Remember, day this was um, day phase three or phase four. This is part of the response to the uh, part of the element that leads to the positive NAO response. And this um, change in the storm tracks have been speculated to play a role in the Atlantic response. Okay, um, and I'm just showing that we have some evidence that that actually occurs here. We haven't quite disentangled uh, all of what it really means yet. So the current work is actually, um, what we're doing is intervention experiments. Uh, we actually have finished them and are analyzing them, not uh, from the NOAA model, the weather forecast model used by NOAA, but actually real forecasts from real initial conditions, okay? And we've added fast and slow MJO cycles. But we've learned our lesson. We've added much smoother cycles to try to get uh, than we did before. Um, and we're trying to determine um, if we can see some of the, you know, the stronger NAO response maybe a little bit later for the slow episodes compared to the fast episodes. Um, what is the, we're trying to look at what is the role of veritopic instability. Um, and the real sort of pay, the really important practical point is to answer the following question. Andy showed how the improvement in MJO prediction is, is there is an improvement in MJO prediction now. So to what extent would a really good prediction of the MJO tropical convection two to four weeks in advance be associated with dramatically improved extratropical predictions? That's kind of the goal that we're leading to, okay? We're interested in the exotropic response to MJO, not just because we're interested in the response and intellectually why it occurs, but is it worth spending a ton, ton of money and a lot of observation systems and a lot of modeling work to get a better forecast of the MJO? Okay, will that really give us forecast windows of opportunity to forecast things that are going on even as far in the Atlantic? Um, in beyond three weeks. All right. Thank you. I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you.